Hello Aces and welcome to part 2 of the story of Ace Combat 7 next playing to new players. In part 1, which you can watch it right here and I recommend you to do so, I did a quick summary of what happened in the previous games such as Ace Combat 4, Ace Combat 5 and Ace Combat 0 so you get a little bit of a more of a background on what happened there. Now I did get the question of what happened about Ace Combat 6, do I need to know about that game? The answer is you don't need to care about Ace Combat 6, it, it, the story has nothing to do with Ace Combat 7, most likely. And thank you so much for your support. I know many of you guys did enjoy that video and I'm making of course part two as I promised. Now I know it's been over a year since I posted part one and I know I apologize for the procrastination but that was kind of intentional so I could get more details on the story, the main themes, the characters and the missions of Ace Combat 7 to make this video because the release date is also very close. It's good to have that refresher and or introduction to the new players right before you get the game, right? So let's get started with part 2 where I'll talk about specifically the events in Ace Combat 7. Now the thing you should know about Ace Combat 7 is there are actually two story modes. The regular game which is you know the big story of the, all the characters and so on. And also the VR mode which is more of a very short story very condensed. But let's start with the VR mode because that happens before the main events of the game. So the VR mode, which is only available on the PlayStation 4, it takes place in the year of 2014 in the continent of Yuzia again in the fictional planet of Strangeru. Now if you recall from part 1 of this video, I mentioned that the country of Ruja after they lost the war back in Ace Combat 4 was occupied by ISAF, basically the allies, because no one really trusts Ruja because maybe they could start a war again, at least in the near future. But there was a group involved that was trying to regain the independence of Ruja and try to get rid of the occupation from the allies in the few years after the war. And this movement was called Free Ruja, obviously. And they came back in Ace Combat 5 in the arcade mode, but guess what? The story mode of Ace Combat 7 in the, in the VR, it's Free Ruja Strikes again. And who do you call when you need help in kicking some Erosion ass? Our Lord and Savior, Mobius One, who is the protagonist of Ace Combat 4, and he also appeared in the arcade mode of Ace Combat 5, and he will be the playable character now in Ace Combat 7's VR mode. One notable difference between Ace Combat 7's VR mode and the previous games is that Mobius One is not affiliated with the ISAF anymore, which used to be a coalition of countries inside the Museum continent. Now he's part of the International Union of Peacekeeping Forces, basically you know like the UN peacekeepers and they have been deploying the continent of Yuzia, you know, just to be on standby against any threats and which did happen obviously because Free Arugia is back at it again. In terms of story on the VR mode, don't expect too much, There's there, there are no cutscenes because that they can't really do that in VR, it's, it's just complicated. So the story is mainly given to you during the briefings and debriefings of each mission. For mission 1, Mobius 1 is informed there's a flight of unknown aircraft and as you know, every time we have an unknown aircraft in Ace Combat, it's an enemy. You know you're gonna have to shut it down. So basically you have to get in touch and intercept this unknown uh, formation of enemies which include bombers and attackers and protect your airbase from their attack. That's basically mission one, where you'll talk to AWAC Sky Eye, which is a callback from Ace Combat 4, and some other pilots who have call signs similar to ones in Ace Combat 4. So you get a little bit of nostalgia from that. There isn't much detail on the story or development of the VR mode, it's relatively simple, you're gonna shoot the, the enemies down, that's it. In the second mission of the VR mode, you basically you're taking off from your base that is under attack from enemy fighters and you have to just basically scramble while everything is blowing up like it's fine it's fine to take off like look at this yeah it's not fine but you do it anyway so basically you help to repel the attack from free Rouge on your base and then you have to protect a substation from enemy attacks because that substation provides electricity to your base which is necessary to keep your radars and your automatic defense systems up and you're gonna mop up the enemies there, basically that's it. There is still a third mission which I don't know the details yet and I am unsure how it's gonna be the end. I'm not sure if they're gonna add some VR missions later on, maybe via DLC, 
But basically, that's the story of the VR mode. There are not, there's not much character development. It's basically you just go there. It's, it's very simple. It's, it's pretty arcadey. And with that said, now it's time to talk about the non-VR story of the game. There's quite a bit to cover, including the prelude, including the countries, the characters, and some of the missions, including Mission 1, Mission 2, Mission 3, Mission 6, and Mission 7, and some of the things we have seen in the trailers, some gameplay footage, and also some interviews with journalists. Of course, since I'll be explaining this story, there will be some spoilers, but they're already out there on the internet. If you're following the news, you might have seen them. And most of them are pretty much related to the early game, so it's not something that I personally think will affect your overall experience, you know, especially with whatever plot twists they're gonna have in the mid to late game. So the main events of Ace Combat 7 take place in the year of 2019 in a conflict known as the Lighthouse War. In one side of the ring we have the Ocean Federation, this massive, huge, superpower, you know, very rich, very industrialized, with a very large military that was the main protagonist back in Ace Combat 5. And of course, they love freedom way too much, and then you can say that's basically the United States in Ace Combat. And on the other side of the ring we have the Kingdom of Arusia, which was the antagonist back in Ace Combat 4. And Arusia is more like, you know, like a mix of France and Italy, although they don't surrender that easily, and they don't switch sides because they don't have anyone else to switch. And that's kind of what Eruja is really. So the story of the game begins when Olsia decided they want to make a space elevator, or rather, build one. Now, we don't really know what was the reason. I do personally believe it was just to explore space, because the space elevators, they make it really cheap to go to space. And they decided to do that between the years of 2011 and 2019. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, Olsia is this very rich, very large country, and instead of building the space elevator in their own country, they said it, I'm gonna build right here. And if you don't like it, sucks to be you, because I'll be putting some extra security that will never be stolen or used against me. First, of course, I'm gonna deploy several of my military forces across the continent so no one can threaten me under the name of the United Nations Peacekeeping Forces or the United Union Peacekeeping Forces. And just because I want to put some more high-tech stuff, I'm gonna make some two airborne aircraft carriers, also known as the Arsenal Bird. We have one that's called Liberty, and the other one is called Justice. That's such American names, right? Osia thought having two airborne aircraft carriers that are able to carry over 80 UAVs, known as the MQ-101, would be a very safe measure that no one would mess with them. And of course, these weapons would never be used against them because they better put some good firewall and antivirus. As you can expect, the Kingdom of Arusia wasn't too happy with Osia just building several military bases around their borders and pulling some troops from all across the continent just to patrol the area. So they thought, well, we better make some good pranks here. And so the Kingdom of Arusia declared a surprise war against the Ocean Federation with a prank that will surpass Pearl Harbor. So think about it, how can a country so small like Arusia be able to take on a superpower like the Ocean Federation who has countless aircraft carriers, a large air force and a large army? Here's what they did. So basically in the years before the war, Arusia invested heavily into drones. They have even the MQ-99, which is this drone right here, that is modeled after the real-life Barracuda drone. So, because Arusia is this small country, they have to go to some unconventional tactics. Basically, they hid their drones inside shipping containers that were transported via trains, trucks, or ships, close to Osea's military infrastructure, that is, you know, naval ports, army bases or military airfields. So basically what they could do is just deploy the drones out of the containers because they were had rocket propulsion to take off and strike the targets very fast and OCA had no chance to defend themselves on this surprise attack. And that is how Arusia managed to give some heavy damage to OCA, who is a country located in another continent because modern problems require modern solutions. And their attack was so heavy, they were able to destroy almost all of Osea's aircraft carriers and basically Osea didn't have a chance to react because it's like Arusia is just spawning behind them when in the match. It's kind of unfair, but their tactic worked and they were also able to capture this, their international space elevator. 
Oh yeah, and do you remember those flying aircraft carriers that OSIA put so much time and effort on them that they would protect the International Space Elevator and would totally not be used against them? Well, Erosia got in possession of them. I don't know how, but maybe they hired hacker men and they are now controlling the Arsenal birds, the two of them. And it's funny because OSIA did not learn their lesson because the same thing happened in Ace Quantum 5 where they had their super weapons stolen. Congratulations, Osia! That's what happens when you don't upgrade your antivirus. And so, all of this happens at the very beginning of the game, so you don't have time to tell Osia to renew their antivirus subscription. And in Days Combat 7, you'll be playing as Trigger, a faceless protagonist that doesn't really speak, he's just there chilling. He is part of the Mage Squadron of the Ocean Air Force. And he was actually deployed to the continent of Yuzia because Osia is so imperialist, they gotta patrol the world, you know, the word police, basically. So he was there during the declaration of war and he's all caught up in the Blitzkrieg. In the mission one of the game, basically your main task is to take off and intercept some enemy bombers that are attacking our air base, which is the Fort Grace Air Base. And so after you finish mission one, you're gonna get a cutscene that explains in a slightly more professional tone the whole war situation between Erugia and Osia. And you're gonna see how bad it was for Osia just because of the whole Blitzkrieg thing. And basically after that is gonna be your mission to regain the control of the International Space Elevator on a counterattack against the Erugian forces who are able to occupy most of the Eusean continent. Now here's where things get a little bit complicated because I can't tell too much about the story without spoiling the game, so let me try to simplify. Mission 2 is an air-to-ground operation where you have to retake an airbase, and that's as much as I'm gonna talk about Mission 2. There's something very interesting but that has not been shown to the public before. You're gonna see in Mission 2. And in Mission 3 is probably the mission you guys have seen the most because a lot of gameplay has been posted. In Mission 3, it that mission takes place over the Choppingburg Rainforest, where your operation or your, your objective there is just to regain air superiority and help out an allied squadron who is fighting in that region. And so the mage squadron is gonna arrive in the airspace and destroy the remaining Erosion aircraft. Now the thing is, when something is too easy in Ace Combat, that's because you're gonna get a mission update. And the mission update of Mission 3 is that you're gonna face the Arsenal Bird. Remember that unmanned aircraft carrier that OC built before the war and it's now being used against them? Yeah, that's gonna suck. Because the Arsenal Bird is capable of carrying 80 UAVs and they're gonna keep throwing them at you and your allies to the point where your allies are so damaged you're gonna have to escort them back to their base. And the thing is, you cannot destroy the Arsenal Bird in that mission because it also has its shield. It's gonna be activated there. So, the ending of Mission 3, I can't tell you yet because there's something that has not been shown to the public yet, but I'll tell you one thing. I finished the mission and my hands were shaking after that and I don't have Parkinson. That's some, there's something very special in the ending of that mission. Now, even though you're not able to destroy the Arsenal Bird at the end of Mission 3, if you think about it, things are still going relatively well. Osea is gaining ground, getting closer to the International Space Elevator. But after Mission 3, some very interesting things happen. Trigger, the protagonist, is kicked out of the Mage Squadron and gets thrown into the Spare Squadron. Now, think about it, because Spare is quite an interesting name. So the spare squadron is actually comprised of prisoners of war and they are therefore expendable, hence spare. And basically they are just acting as cannon fodder and flying aircraft into the most dangerous missions where they are not really expected to come back. Now you may ask yourself then, why is Osia using a expendable squadron comprised of you know expendable pilots? And that's because that's how Stranger works. Like literally, there's so many airplanes in Stranger, it's like, it's fine, it's, it's a couple million dollar plane, but we have so many of them, just, just throw them in there, like paper airplane. Now, you might ask yourself, why did Trigger get kicked out? Like, what, what happened there? And this is probably the heaviest spoiler in this, in this video. If you want to skip the spoiler, you can go to this timer right here. Are you sure? Are you sure you're not gonna skip? Okay, if you're still here, it's because you are. You want to know. You want to know this stuff. So apparently, what happened is uh, Trigger killed the former president. Yeah, that's that's that was kind of really bad. 
<laughs> like, how do you kill a former president? I don't know how exactly, but it ends up that Trigger apparently killed President Harley, who used to be the president back in Ace Combat 5, because that's he is the only OCN president that we know. Something happened there, he killed the president, he got kicked out of Mage Squadron, and he was sent to Spare Squadron. The interesting thing about Spare Squadron is that uh, all the pilots, they have strikes on their planes. And Trigger, since he did the worst thing of all, he has three strikes. While all the other planes, as you're gonna see in the trailer or in the gameplay videos posted already, they have either one or two. So it's gonna be interesting to see why, the, what did the other pilots do to be sent to this mercenary, not mercenary, sorry, this expendable squadron. And now that Trigger gets sent to the Spare Squadron, he gets to participate in pretty much the worst missions as possible. And even the AWACS changes to reflect that. Instead of being accompanied by AWACS Skykeeper from the early missions in the game, we now have the upgraded AWACS Bandog, the best AWACS in the game. Spare 15 is broken through the thunder clouds. Nice work for a dumbass. Why are we risking our lives to wipe someone else's ass? Start complaining when you can get your own nose clean. Quit scratching your ass and approach the enemy. I should totally do a compilation of AWACS Bandog because if you have him, you need no enemies. So, what we know so far are Mission 6 and Mission 7 because we have seen a little bit of their gameplay on YouTube and they also are the missions from the demos. So in Mission 6, what we know so far is it's a ground battle. So basically you have to destroy the ground targets, you destroy some of them, you get a mission update and there are some drones that appear. That's what all we know so far. And Mission 7 is also a very important mission. This is called First Contact. Because that is the first time we're gonna meet the main antagonist of the game, this old man, Mihai. So if you don't recall, Mission 7 is the one with the thunderstorms and you know the rock pillars. Basically in that mission you are sent in to rescue an allied reconnaissance unit and basically you know you gotta you gotta be your cannon fodder there just you know put yourself between your allies and the enemies that's how it is and what is gonna happen at the end of the mission is that you're gonna battle against the, again the old man Mihai but uh, what we know is that both of the pilots survive at the end I don't know exactly what it is because the ending of mission 7 has never been shown to the public so that's kind of where I have all the information for the missions thus far. Since I have covered all the missions we know thus far, let's talk about the characters of the game, starting with our favorite old man, Mihai. Uh, something I cannot pronounce because it's a Hungarian name. Or you can also call Chilaj, kind of ish. So this guy is an erosion pilot who is working on a somewhat of an ex scientific experiment. If you notice, he flies the Russian Sukhoi 30. It's a two-seater aircraft, but behind him, there is no other pilot. There is no co-pilot. Instead, you're gonna see like this little ball, which no one really knows exactly what it is, but it seems like a sensor so he can teach the AI how to fly planes. It is believed that he is an experiment to, you know, improve the drones that Erugia is it's making. Although Mihai has a, a little bit of a problem because uh, he seems that his health is not doing so well. He's like, oh boy, this body is getting old. Because it is implied, at least in the trailers that we've seen thus far, that he is a veteran pilot who has fought in many wars in the past. We don't know exactly what wars or who he fought against or how so, but this guy has some experience. Working together with Mihai is Dr. Schroeder. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. I do not speak German. This guy apparently is the one conducting the test together with Mihai. He is the main scientist. But there is some expe speculation based on his name that he's, he's not from Erusia. It is not confirmed yet. But people believe that he's a scientist from a foreign country that uh, was very involved in past games quite a few times. And also on the erosion side of the story, we have the princess, the head of the government, Princess Rosa Cosettelis, who was the one who declared war against the Ocean Federation. You're gonna see her in a lot of the trailers, she seems to be gonna play a major role in the story. And of course, I can tell you already, best waifu of all times, even though the game is not released, but I believe in her. And the last main character I should talk about is 
Avru Mead. She has a, quite an interesting story because before the war started, she was renovating or rebuilding an F-104 Starfighter to flying condition. It's quite an old plane. And when she was flying it, she ended up getting shot down by an Ocean F-15. And she survived, believe it or not. And she got sent to the Penal Squadron, which is that uh, spare squadron that I mentioned before, where she is the maintenance girl to fix the planes. Because she's so good at maintenance, they had to make some use for her. And we also have Cupman, my favorite member of the spare squadron. Because, I don't know, I just I just think he's funny. You're gonna fly together with him. Get used to it. Now, of course, there will be other characters in the game, but the ones I explained before are the main ones. The other characters you get to talk during the missions as your wingman, as the base commander, and some other people. You're gonna see the radio comes. Ace Combat is very heavy on, on the dialogue. And so, if I had to summarize the plot of Ace Combat 7, I would say the game would touch on a few different topics. First, of course, we have... The war between humans and machines, you know, all the drone warfare with human pilots against unmanned aircraft. That's going to be a major point in the game, as you have seen in the trailers already. We also have to talk about fake news. It's going to be a major point in the game. Because Ace Combat has a journalistic approach to the game, where basically you get to see what the people in that universe see on TV. So, are you seeing the Ocean side or are you seeing the Erosion side? Which side is correct? What is the interpret? What are the different interpretations of the facts that actually happen? That's gonna be a main thing in the game. That actually the same writer he did very well in Ace Combat Four. If you're more interested, check my videos on Ace Combat Four. Another topic is gonna get a little bit philosophical, such as what is a nation? There's some kind of a philosophy on what constitutes like a group of people and is it fair to declare war on this other group of people, this other nation. Ace Combat can get pretty philosophical at a times and that's gonna come back in Ace Combat 7. Besides national sovereignty, we also might get a little bit into space and space warfare because some scenes of the trailers suggest that the satellites are being destroyed for the purposes of war warfare. So the game might touch a little bit on that and also maybe civilians dying or being protected at, at war and what measures are being taken. This is something that Ace Combat 7 touches on. Some minor details on the story I should touch on is that Ace Combat is pretty heavy on super weapons. You already seen them with the Arsenal Bird. We're gonna see more of it with the return of Stonehenge, which is an anti-asteroid rail gun, but that it but that can be used as an anti-aircraft gun. Now the thing was you don't know if it's gonna be an enemy or friendly, if you had to protect it or destroy it. And Usually Ace Combat has a final boss super weapon, but no information on that as well. You also have the Space Elevator that is incompatible with future games like Ace Combat 3, which is a sequel. So, it's very interesting to know if uh, is the Space Elevator is going to be destroyed in this game or not. The thing with Ace Combat 3 is that it's such a different game. The whole geopolitical situation is different. Nations exist, but they're not as powerful. The, the world is ruled by corporations. So we might see the end of nations or, or governments as, as they are in, in the real world today, in Ace Combat 7, and have the corporations take over the world. Also related to Ace Combat 3, which takes place in 2040, it's a pretty futuristic game, there's going to be a relationship between a father in Ace Combat 7 and a character from Ace Combat 3. I don't know who it is yet. This is information from one of the Japanese interviews that the devs made. But it, there's going to be quite a few connections to other games. So if you are a fan, you should be looking forward to it. And so this is what I have to say about Ace Combat 7's story mode. I hope this video has helped you new players to get a little bit, some more information and to understand what the heck is going on. Because it can be especially hard for a universe you've never took a look into it. So you get to see, you know, a little bit of the context of what you see in the trailers or the gameplay and know a little bit what is going on. Now, don't be scared. I know it sounds like you have to know the previous games to know all the references. You don't. Don't worry about that. You just need to have a fun time. Ace Combat 7, its story is pretty standalone. You're still going to be able to enjoy it. Way better than my explanation here. I took a little bit of a peek into the game. It's looking pretty good. Now, please, guys, I only have one request for you, which is 
don't watch the entire playthrough of Ace Combat 7 on YouTube instead. Play the game for yourself for the first time. The first playthrough of Ace Combat can be quite a powerful experience. This is the reason why I'm doing YouTube for Ace Combat. Because Ace Combat back in the days were quite powerful in my whole life. So that is my recommendation for you. Play the game, don't watch just all the videos. And if you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing to my channel and liking, sharing the video. That helps me a lot. And I have a pretty cool spoiler policy from when Ace Combat 7 gets released. You can check more information about here. But if you don't subscribe, I won't spoil the game right in front of you. It's pretty safe. Do not worry. So that is it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.